Wow, Pap is really killing it, isn't he? Wait, let me see that again. <laughs> Wait, one more time. Butt lovers. In the land of curves and curls, my subscribers are the swellest people around. Aww. I know I say this every time, but I think this one's gonna be the weirdest one yet. You see, here on the Athena P YouTube channel, we explore the lore of shows and commercials that one time that no one else is brave enough to. It's a big claim, but I stand by it. Today, I'm sharing with you my findings as someone that binge-watched Roly Poly Oli. Now, even though Roly Poly Oli is a wholesome, family-friendly show, this is your fair warning that these videos are for the purposes of a mature audience, like me, experiencing nostalgia and having a little bit of a laugh. So there will be some no-no words such as darn, damn, and fuck. And if you're not a fan of that, that's fine, but you legally now cannot complain about it because because I told you, wow, cool. Anyway, roly poly ole. This show aired from 1998 when I was born. You're old. To 2004 on CBC Television in Canada, Playhouse Disney in the United States, and France 5 in, well, France. Now this show, unlike most of the others I covered, was actually a huge part of my childhood, but I remembered virtually none of it. Like, oh my god, the house and furniture are alive, what is happening? Genuinely, all I remembered was a theme song, and even that caught me off guard, because I remembered it starting with, he's roly poly yoly, he's small and smart and round, but it really starts with, way up high in a roly poly sky, and that's exactly how it sounds, and this is the visual that accompanies it, and I'm tripping already. The vibe of this show is contradictory in every way. It's old fashioned like the 50s, but also futuristic. It's animated like rubber hose in the way the characters move and dance, but it's also 3D animation like Jimmy Neutron, which is actually next month's lore video. It's boring, but also fun. They're so human, but the characters are robots. AI art may be stinky, but human made art about AIs? Give me 78 episodes of that, but forget to put the last season on Disney Plus, why don't you? Let me acquaint you with the main characters before we fall down this rabbit hole, and to clarify, these are only the main characters, so any character we meet after season one, we'll talk about later. The titular character is Oli. He's like a Hey Arnold, Arthur, Tommy Pickles from Rugrats kind of character. Just an all-around nice dude and everyman. Faults along the way, but loyal, imaginative, and family-oriented. Spot is his dog, and he's a dog, and that's his only thing. His mom and dad are the perfect parents. Patient, kind, and the perfect example of what marriage could be. Pappy said, get a room. They're still going. God, they're so in love. The dad is an inventor, and the mom, as far as I know, is a stay-at-home mom. I don't think jobs are a big deal in this universe, though. When I say the dad is an inventor, I mean he invents things for his house. He doesn't, like, go out and sell them or anything. They are just enjoying life, from dancing to bowling to the mom is actually a great drummer. It's very fun and cute. Zoe is Oli's younger sister, and she flip-flops between being really wholesome and adorable and sweet to, like, really annoying. So very accurate depiction of a child. Uncle Gizmo is based on Austin Butler, I mean, I'm sorry, Elvis. And flashback younger Uncle Gizmo is voiced by Michael Cera, which I wasn't expecting, so just like fun fact. Hey, you you to make me uh -huh. Uncle Gizmo is the older brother of the dad, whose name is Percy. And Pappy is Oli and Zoe's grandfather, and I didn't know what side he was on until season four. Here's the bullet point I wrote. Pappy paternal grandfather confirmed. I was very excited about this huge revelation, I guess. So yes, Pappy is the dad and Gizmo's dad. Oli's best friend Billy, aka the best character, ranges from a bit of a troublemaker more so in season one to more shy than Ole. I'm going to address a bit of this now before we get into everything, but Billy and his family moved to the roly-poly planet from the planet QB. The episode Squaresville mostly focused on the challenges of being a square boy in a round world. Oli also didn't realize and recognize his privilege until he made an imaginary square world for Billy. And when he saw how it was much more difficult for him, a round boy, to operate in a square world, he says he can understand how Billy must feel now. Round and Round and Square We Go is an episode where the families of Oli and Billy meet up for a dinner, and we see the clear differences in their culture. Different food, different dances. And the end lesson is to embrace new cultures and no one tries to change each other. Which is a very anti-assimilation message for a TV show with a 50s feel. And I have to stand. So my biggest question was, if it's harder for them to do things on the roly-poly planet, why did they even decide to move from planet cubing? And they answered my question. In season three episode Square Roots, Billy's parents explained with the following quote. They wanted their kids to see every curve and angle in this crazy jigsaw puzzle we call life. If the show came out now, they'd say it was part of the liberal agenda. 
bad just for teaching a nice message. This series goes zero to a hundred real quick. Like, yes, the way the world works and the way the robots work was always out there. Like, I will never trust this moon. From day one, she scared the shit out of me. But season one focused almost exclusively on mundane slice of life stuff. For example, being annoyed with your sister, pretending, attempting to make your parents breakfast in bed, but you end up making an unedible mess. Very relatable, but from season two on, they go absolutely buck wild. Exploring different planets, technology, setting. Yeah, all of season one happened at Oli's house. So I guess the budget grew once they realized how much everyone was liking this series, so we got to explore more of the planet. Also in season one, some of the dialogue was very awkward. Once upon a time, there was a robot dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a robot dinosaur. <laughs> Wait, why is that funny? But you know what is genuinely funny? The music. It's so narrational and just describes what's happening. She feels so sad. Her flower friend is hanging low. So he feels so sad. God, I wish there was an anthem for me every time I cried. Didn't know babies could grow to be 24 years old. Wah, 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 you bitch. Now witness my roly poly oly memes. It boggles my mind that there aren't more people using this show to like screen grab and turn into internet funnies. I feel like it's a gold mine. I understand it's really for young, young children, so it isn't that rewatchable. But damn it, I can't be the only one. Revisit your childhood and make some memes, damn it. Boy. The alive house and furniture and appliances and toys and vehicles makes me feel really uneasy. That's a very unsettling part of the show because even though it seems that they love the family, for example, they feel so bad about Zoe crying about her harmonica being lost that they get it back for her despite the annoying music she's constantly playing. Where was I? Oh, so even though in examples like this, it seems like they love the family and there's genuine caring and compassion there, I can't help but feel like they're forced to care really because I mean like you're living with these people anyway. The emotions of these Beauty and the Beast-esque servants are almost always overlooked. Like in season one episode 7c Universal Spot, the dad invents this universal remote to control any appliance or furniture at the click of just a button. When the remote is left unattended, the appliances and furniture work together to try and throw it out. This gives us emotional insight about these creatures, how they don't want to be controlled so easily, or they might not even want to be controlled at all. Which makes sense considering in the episode The Best Dog on Show in the World, the TV named Tubi literally got sick from being overused. The house and all the house people are once again seen exhausted in the season four episode, Housey Wake Up. Housey and everyone in Housey is asleep. The family tries to wake everyone up, but when they realize they're also too tuckered out, they decide today is gonna be a rest day. Which first of all, fuck yeah, nothing wrong with a resting day. I say as I watch the show at triple speed, staying up later and later and writing a 10 page essay, all the while I'm working on a video that I'm not even putting out until 2023. Burnout, never heard of her. Um, and second of all, if the roly-poly family wasn't also tired, would they have just forced the house to wake up and work for them? In the episode Space Tally, the emotional well-being of the television is once again overlooked. He feels left out, underappreciated, and even tries to throw himself out, which I don't have to say, relatable king. Here's a quote from the episode. He wants more than just to be watched. He wants to play. I genuinely feel so bad for the animate inanimate objects. Another quote, this time from season five, episode 10, C. Oli's Bottler. We built the first ever voice activated milk and cookie serving bottler. I swear to you, the only difference between the pulley bots and the others is that the pulley bots have free will. It's like the wall gem and the brush gem from Steven Universe that got totally brushed over. No pun intended. Well, a little bit intended. Also, I have no idea how they decide which things are gonna be alive and which things aren't. In the episode Snowy, the dad says, Snowy is just a decoration, Oli. He's not real, which is rich, bro. Last episode, Zoe almost broke and straight up murdered Starry, the alive tree star. Okay, one last thing. In the season two episode, De Plain, De Plain, Oli, Pappy, and Billy all make paper airplanes and they turn alive. But Zoe makes this flying hat thing and it isn't alive? Why? Maybe because Zoe's creation is also clothing and none of the clothing that they wear is alive because I guess the implications of that are too weird. Like, oh, we're not gonna wear something that's like alive. We're not gonna put something that's alive on our bodies. But the alive car with the arm seat belts is totally fine. Okay, whatever you say. The technology 
actually is bizarre aside from them just being alive because their TV is so old fashioned and yet the dad has invented a shrink slash grow ray, an invisible ray, cloning machine, time machine, rocket car, reversing gravity machine, a machine that can give you superpowers and much, much more. Isn't it funny how old sci-fi shows like this can fathom inventions that still don't exist that we know of, but they couldn't imagine like an iPhone or an Android phone. Also, I love that their approach to time travel is more of a literal rewind. Yeah, it's rewind time. Where they're doing all of the motions again in reverse, but they're actively aware of what's happening. Did you touch the rewind later? Did you put your name in the goblet of fire? Also during one part of the rewind episode, they went so far back in time that the theme song played again, which I thought was quite cheeky. I like that quite a lot. I was not expecting to have a whole section of this video dedicated to the holidays and traditions of the roly poly planet, but these bitches have so many holidays. Where do I even start? How about the Halloween special? So their equivalent of Halloween is Ookie Spooky Day. Ookie Spooky is this jack-o'-lantern man that comes to steal your remote. So what we think is Pappy dressed up as the Ookie Spooky man starts chasing the kids. The parents are laughing about it. We're having a grand old time, but then we discover that Pappy was sleeping the whole time. So in true Halloween fashion, the parents are like, the th then who was that? Pretty fucking creepy, to be honest. Then after that, we experienced the three-part Christmas special, but they don't have Christmas as we know it over there because there are no religious implications. We're talking about Jingle Jangle Day, roasting wing nuts on an open fire, clanky claws, the reindeer are rockets, and their names are Whirly Curly, Zoom, Kaboom, Turbo Blaster, Sonic, and Boom, and his belly shook like a bowl full of jelly? No, like a 55 Chevy. Hilarious, fun, clever wordplay, sure. Do you know what it takes for it to snow on this planet? In the words of Percy, the daddy, Mr. Sonny blew a bulb. It got so cold, it snowed. Okay, so their son fully goes out and it just changes the weather. I guess that actually checks out since nothing on their planet relies on the sun's energy. So I guess even the veggies, fruits, and plants are robotic too. Sure. I can't even elaborate because three seasons later, in season five's A Jingle Jangle Wish, we see that people can just casually visit Clanky Claws by flying to the planet Chillsville. Even with the familiarity of Christmas, they just take it to the next level. Did someone say next level? Uh, yeah, you just did. This was supposed to be a seamless transition. Shut up. No, you shut up. Hey, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. I'm sorry, but you just took this argument to the next level. Did someone say next level? The episode Springy Chicken takes holidays to the next level. I literally don't even know how to summarize this holiday, so I'm just gonna read directly from the Roly Poly Oli Wiki. It's the first day of spring, and it's a Polyville tradition for the Poly family and the Bevel family, that's Billy's family, to grow decorative eggs, spring clean their homes, build a large nest, and do the chicken dance. Also, the Springy Chicken could lay their families a giant lucky egg. Okay. The next episode of Poly Extravaganza picks up right where the springy chicken left off, with the families now having to look after the springy chicken's egg while she's away. I'm sorry, this holiday sounds so stressful. I would not want to piss off a dinosaur-sized chicken. The only holiday more stressful is Silly Willy Day, where the family is all gray and gloomy. Until it's Silly Willy Day. This is the day the comet Silius flies back around, returning all the color and silliness. So they go from depression to a high level of happiness. Let's meet somewhere in between. <laughs> no, seriously, I would hate this holiday. Look at it. This looks like a Zoloft commercial. In the episode of Day for Night, it's eclipso rama Day. The day turns to night because the moon gets between the sun and the planet Pole. So Pappy, Oli, and Zoe do a lot of fun nighttime activities. Wearing PJs, playing flashlight tag, setting up camping tents, and more. Finally, a holiday that sounds fun. But wait, there's more. Season 4, episode 10, a cheery sphery day. Can you guess what holiday it is? <coughs> it's cheery sphery day. First, they hang up the roly-poly planet flag, which is just a picture of their planet. And the holiday is to remind them that all shapes are important, which is pretty hilarious because in the name of the holiday, there's only one mentioned. Whatever you say. Season 5, episode 8B, Always Chasing Rainbows, is not necessarily a holiday, but a fun thing you can do when you see a rainbow on the roly-poly planet. You can find a roly trolley with a pot of golden lug nuts under the rainbow. But on this planet, rainbows can blow away because they are physical, tangible things, not just a reflection of light. And when they move, they leave behind rainbow puddles. I've completely 180'd on my position. I, I want to live on this planet now. That sounds awesome. This is the part of the video where I go on a tangent about what I learned from the show, an ever-humbling experience considering this show is made for four-year-olds. So I was watching with subtitles and discovered that this knock 
is called Shave and a Haircut. The full call and response seven note couplet is actually Shave and a Haircut two bits. It's so funny because I've heard the musical version and the knock version, but never put together that it's, it's the same thing. It's from the same thing. I also learned that in many languages, there are different meanings. So if you were to knock on someone's door like this in Mexico, they might react a lot differently because the words associated with that rhythm slash tune is something along the lines of fuck your mother bastard. The Italian version is kill the old lady with flit, with flit being an old fashioned brand of insecticide? Are you okay? Yeah? In Spain, it is sung with the lyrics, a shot of schnapps. And there's just, there's so many more, but we gotta get back to Roly Poly Ole. Robot anatomy time. Season three's Let's Make History describes the whole history of the Roly Poly world. First, they start with some guy that was traveling through space for ice cream and stumbled upon the planet, blah, 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 don't care. But then part two, electricity explains how they used to be powered by like wind up, little things and how this was impractical because their energy would diminish very quickly. This was changed by Dr. Cranky Kooky who wanted to capture the electricity. So he's basically the roly poly version of Ben Franklin. So they just forced their own evolution, kind of baller. Speaking of baller, instead of roll over, Spot is able to roly poly where he makes himself into a ball and rolls around much like the pill bugs that are also called Roly polies. Oh my god, like the name of the show. Let's look at more animals before we get back to the people. Here's what a fish looks like to them, which kind of reminds me of the Pokemon Violet Iron Forms, which don't get me started on that make me very sad. Speaking of this fish, it had kids without the presence of another fish. Keep that idea in your back pocket. In the episode Song of the Bluefish, we see all sorts of animals on Pappy's farm, but we're going to focus specifically on this cow that can squirt out ice cream through its udders. Thank God PETA never got its hands on the show. I I guess you can say you guys are all as heartless as robots. Shut the hell up, bitch. Season one episode, House Detectives, dad goes to the hardware store to get a gear for Pappy because he lost one, causing him to constantly kick himself in the butt. And dad explains, roly poly parts as old as Pappy are hard to find. Similar situation happened in the episode, Why to Pappy? When one of Pappy's gears bent, when Oli showed concern, the old geezer replied with, that's just part of being an old time classic model like me. So this brings up a point of new models for the new generations. But I also wondered, do robots die? Surely they wouldn't bring up such a dark topic. Season five, episode six, A, Madam Butterfly, Pappy talks about his wife, Grandma Lulu, and he laments, even though she's gone, her memory will always be here. I'm sorry, I think I got something in my eye. <sighs> Get it together. Hey, remember that time Spot peed on the carpet? Urinary and digestive system confirmed. Which means their anatomy is much similar to ours than Higley Town Heroes is. Interestingly enough, bots can also get sick. So I thought this was gonna be something similar to like a computer virus, but they actually do experience physical ailments. Oli gets polypox in the episode Polypox. And even though this isn't an illness, I have to point it out. In the season five episode, Chunk Sings the Blues, the singer gets a pimple. I wonder what that would even look like. Oh my God, dude, that's a cyst. And I'm one of those nasty fucks that just wants to, mm. <laughs> I have a problem. Bots have a lot of cool features such as stretchy limbs, popping wheels from the bottom of their feet, but this just in. New anatomical crisis just dropped. In the season three episode switcheroo, Billy and Oli switch heads. They didn't even need an invention for this like I thought they would. They just span around and plop their heads on their friend's body. Oli, I'm exhausted. Can I have my body back? Ooh, I can't. I sold it. What? How could you do this to me? I mean, in my defense, look at this. Last Christmas, I gave you my heart and my head and, and my limbs and all my organs and the very next day, you gave it away. So this of course led me to the question, are all their body parts detachable? And turns out, yes. In season five's Follow Your Nose, Oli's nose falls off and Billy's ear falls off. Also lastly, in season four, the kids asked Wheelie, why do you have a wheel, Wheelie? And Wheelie responded, well, that's just the way I was put together, I guess. First of all, love the disability rep and how even though it changes the way he does things, it doesn't mean he couldn't do these things like Oli and Billy assumed. And also since he was essentially saying, I was born like this, we can assume that they're born by being put together. We'll come back to this when I discuss the movies. But first, speaking of Wheelie, let's discuss all the characters that we met from season two onward. Even though Wheelie wasn't introduced until season four, we'll start with him since I already mentioned him. He's first seen as a delivery boy and he's older than the other kids in the series, even helping to babysit Oli. Very wholesome dude, he just wants to help out whenever he can. His introduction in the series was a bit strange though. In the episode Wheelie, Oli acts like he's never met Wheelie, but we saw Wheelie in episode prior and Oli was talking to them like they were buds for forever. I thought Disney Plus was out of order, but I actually double checked and I think they might've just 
aired the episodes weird. I also want to read you my first impressions of the character when I saw him in Blue Koopy because remember, I thought that was the first official introduction. I wrote, never heard of him plus ratio plus should have been named Una Michael. My A plus plus commentary is added again. Someone stop her. Next, we'll talk about Polly. In the season two episode, Love Bug, Oli's mom invites the new neighbor over to play with Oli and Billy. And when she comes over, they both immediately have a crush on Polly Pie. I mean, there was a Love Bug Cupid thing that hit them, but come on. She of course looks like Oli in a wig. And don't they go to school? How is this the first girl they've met their age? So glad I thought this because we don't see their school until season five. And the only students there are Oli, Billy, Polly, and the new student that's being introduced that episode, Screw It. So this means before Polly moved there, the only kids in the class were Billy and Oli. Anyway, thankfully after Polly's introduction, they're just good friends with her. It's not like weird after that. One thing I really like about her character is she's always looking out for Zoe, especially during playtime when she might be being steamrolled or the boys are like dismissing her. Polly always wants to make Zoe feel included. In the season three episode, Spot fell in love with Polly's dog, Fifi. Of course her name is Fifi, and of course she looks like this. Can you tell she's a girl dog? And Spot is clearly the boy dog because he doesn't wash his ass. Anyway, let's talk about the biggest ass, Screwy. Insufferable. This dude is a bully and a victim all wrapped up into one. He was rude in his intro and I thought it was the kind of issue that would be resolved in one episode. Roly Poly Oli isn't the type of show that would seem like it would have a villain, but like, he is a true villain. His cry for attention just kept getting meaner and this all came to a head in the episode Screwy Day. Screwy was repeatedly making fun of Billy for being a square and my little dude Oli fucking punched him! My boy wound up! Broken! Punch! The parents, of course, say that violence is not the answer, and it's a good lesson for kids. I get why they did that. But if there was ever a time for violence, it would be now. Screwy was being shapist. And even at the end, after all the terrible things he said, this little bitch tries to pull, it's because I'm a lug nut, isn't it? Only Polly and Billy, like the little kings and queens they are, said, no, we don't have a problem with lug nuts. We have a problem with you. You're the problem. You're the worst. And that's when he started getting his act together. I'm going to go over all the worlds and species we meet prior to the movies. But first we have to look at the fact that Planet Poli has a flag and Planet QB has a pledge. So it's clear that like planets near each other are actually more like how we view countries. They're able to visit each other and each planet in and of itself has its own culture and it isn't split up into different regions like how Earth is. I also believe that Billy and Polly are the same species but different nationalities. I'm not sure if the same thing can be said about the Little Greens. I'm pretty sure they're a different species. They introduced themselves in the season three episode Little Helping Hand. They are little and green and come from the planet Little Green and they're called the Little Greens. In season five's episode The Invasion of the Ticklers we meet the Little Greens pets. They're called Ticklers and ticklers are tiny and kind of look like ticks, except when they land on people, they make them hysterically laugh. Also, I'm jealous the dog can laugh in this universe because my life's mission is to make my dog laugh and she never will. In season four, We Scream for Ice Cream, they visited the Ice Cream Planet, which was alluded to a lot earlier in the series. And lastly, until the movies, in the season five episode, Widget Watchers, we hear that the Widget constellation is going extinct. The reason it's going extinct is because if not enough people watch it, it'll fade. Not only is it a big environmental lesson, like we have to pay attention to the issues so we can resolve them, but it also stresses the importance of not neglecting something or someone, which I would say is the biggest recurring lesson in the series in general. Also, in the last part of the stage production in the episode, episode Let's Make History, they discuss the future. And let me read you the last quote from the episode. Maybe we'll even find other people out there. Maybe we'll even find you. And he looks directly at us and I got chills. I got chills. Tiny tangent before the absolutely wild Space Boy reveal. One lesson I was not expecting was in the episode Doofy Looking Ole, which discussed predatory marketing capitalizing off self-esteem issues. <laughs> yeah. Ole saw a commercial that changed his perception of himself. So he got this kit to fix the way he looked. And when him, his mom, and his dad started trying to fix their flaws with this kit, Zoe pointed out how silly they were all being. Aw, she's too young. The media hasn't corrupted her yet. Well, Zoe, have you ever heard of this thing called TikTok? Anyway, the Space Boy reveal was wild. Space Boy is a show that the kids would watch throughout the series, like it started season one. And the show they were watching always seemed fictional with the way it was presented, like an action show. But in the episode Calling All Space Boys, Space Boy urged the viewers to call in to help him with his mission by giving them a solution to the asteroid problem. So as if this was being filmed live. Oli called in, they executed his idea, and Space Boy personally called him to thank him for helping him save the day. It's basically confirmed he's an actual superhero and not just 
just an actor. This is bizarre because how do they schedule this show? They schedule it around disasters they know are gonna happen, but instead of covering it on the news, they turn this real danger to their world into an action show? What happens if he loses the fight? What happens if he can't save the day? Not only is that the worst episode of your TV show, but you're also probably dead. Space Boy being a real hero was confirmed many times after this. First in the episode Rust in Space, where he helps Oli defeat the Rust monster. And during the season five premiere, Space Boy announced his last show in this galaxy because he needs to help people in other galaxies. First of all, can't believe they didn't announce that that would be the series finale until the end of the episode. Also, Space Boy personally said goodbye to Oli and Billy because Oli and Billy are now casually friends with a superhero celebrity. Pop off. This show's influence surprised me. It extends to so many different things. First, let's start with the main one. When Ben was watching a bit over my shoulder, he said that Roly Poly Oli reminded him of the movie Robots. That's when I stumbled across this article, Robots, Roly Poly Oli on Steroids and discovered the creator of Roly Poly Oli, William Joyce, was also a producer of Robots. Mayhaps I should do a part two where I compare these two pieces of media? Something to consider. Also, you'd be damned if you thought I wasn't going to mention how Pappy is literally just the blueprint for the grandpa I meet the Robinsons. They chase after their teeth constantly and just look at them. He is Bud, he is Pappy, and they are not the same person. Oh my God, both of their wives are also named Lucille. Similar lives and similar wives for real. Oh, and by the way, Meet the Robinsons is actually based on the book A Day with Wilbur Robinson, which was created by, you guessed it, William Joyce. Holy crap, he invented my freaking childhood. This next one's a bit of a stretch, but the animation style of this reminded me of something and I rattled it in my brain. I was like, what is it? The freaking screwdriver guy from Handy Manny. So I looked up William Joyce and nothing came up. William Joyce did not work on Handy Manny, but a handful of animators worked on both shows. And in the season three episode, Dingly Dangly Doodle, we learn a poly swear word. I don't think mom and dad would like to hear you say that word. What word is that? Me say Dingly Dangly Doodle. Crabs is a... Do you kiss your mother with that mouth? You know what I found so funny? Both of these episodes came out in 2001, just months apart from each other. Roly Poly Oli's though, of course, came first. It's probably a coincidence, but I just am astonished at how many things this show set up for future shows and movies and stuff. Now onto my movie bullet points. The planet's expression and animation in the opening sequence makes me queasy. It just doesn't feel like it fits with the rest of the series. I just think they're doing too much. I don't trust these guys. I don't trust like that. I did give props because Gloomius Maximus's design I, I love. The villain number is incredible, but once again, this is such a departure from the usual vibe of the show. Not a problem or complaint necessarily. I still think it's fun, but I feel like fans of the show would get a bit confused. It got really musical theater when the rest of the music was way up. Ah. Lumius Maximus's big plan, because he, he was just causing havoc throughout this movie, it just felt like they combined seven episodes into one. But his biggest plot yet was he was going to move the roly-poly planet from the galaxy of goofs to the galaxy of gloom. In other words, um, I think Mercury's in retrograde. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that's it. Oh, there's a whole other movie? Oh my god. roly poly Oli, second movie, The Baby Bot Chase. We see how babies are made. Let's go! There's a factory in space ran by some sort of mother nature motherboard. We have the scene of Gloomy monologuing about his character development from the first movie, Who Cares? We meet the two new babies of the series, Koo and Coochie. I get the joke, it's Coochie Koo, but like you named a baby Coochie. We gotta talk about it. New Holiday just dropped. It's Family Frolic Day with floats. I then said the one that runs the baby factory might actually be called Mother Goose and she speaks a nursery rhyme. Oh my God, she's in a nursery and she speaks a nursery rhyme. I just got that too. But when I looked it up on the wiki, the actual ship is called Mothership, but the main lady inside that looks like the Mothership is just credited as Kindly Lady. Boo. I also said I believe the babies aren't roly poly bots because they can fly either with the propeller on their head or inflating themselves like a balloon. Also, the wiki calls Coochie and Koo adopted, but I don't really see how if all the bots come from the mothership anyway until they find their forever home. It's not like there's actual mixing of genetics like in Higley Town Heroes. Do they call them adopted because they're a different species? Like, I, I don't know. So after the baby bot chase, I started watching season six because for whatever reason, I thought the babies would be featured in the entirety of season six, but turns out, no. It also turns out that the baby bot chase was the series finale. So I guess it just ends with the introduction of the babies and that's it. But turns out, no, there's like two episodes that feature these poof from Fairly Odd Parents little shits. But it happened so abruptly in the middle of the season
season with no explanation until afterwards? We get the introduction to their characters after the two episodes with no context? And then when we finally do have context, the series just ends? What a weird way to end the series! <laughs> yes indeed, I have two new baby siblings! Who knows what crazy hijinks will ensue? No one. No one will know. Cause the series is over. Hey, what'd I miss? Dude, you should really do the laundry. We did it! We explored a galaxy far, far away, and what did we learn? Our way of life is inferior! Okay, okay, calm down. I really hope you enjoyed this one, butt lovers. Have a great day. Bye!